we, at a certain level, we doubt our own value as architects. Hello, Architect Nation. Enix Sears here, joined today by my co-host, Ryan Willard. Good to see you here today, Ryan. Hey, Nick. How you doing? Well, and as always, you know that this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for discovering how to run your architectural practice with more ease, with more efficiency, and with more wealth. Because as we say here at Business of Architecture, just because you're an architect doesn't mean you need to be poor. And that <laughs> is the topic of today's conversation. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Accurate data, as you know, is crucial, especially in today's tough environment. Outdated and inaccurate project data, specification data, et cetera, can lead to turnarounds, delays, and costs. With supply chain and staffing issues, these costs and delays can multiply. Well, that's why a resource like RCAT.com is so valuable. RCAT works with manufacturers to keep their data up to date and accurate, so you always have the best information for your projects and for your specifications when you need it. In addition to that, accessing the data on RCAT.com is completely free and you don't need to register. Use RCAT's powerful search engine to be able to find what you need and download right there on the site without needing to pay anything or, like I said, even register. Go try RCAT.com today. That's A R C A T.com. If you are a firm owner, be sure you head over and you haven't already caught our 60-minute firm owner masterclass. What are you waiting for? Do you want to leave the droves of the impoverished masses and join the new elite of the architecture industry who are discovering that it is possible to make massive amounts of wealth and be an architect and pursue your passion? Head on over to smartpracticemethod.com. All right, Ryan, welcome here we are to talk about this idea. We're both architects, so we can talk about it as being us. Is it possible to be artistically rich as well as financially rich? What are some of the challenges that would even make us ask such a question that we're seeing in the industry that you and I have seen? Because we both went to architecture school. Ryan studied at the Bartlett, top premier college, uh, university in, in London. Uh, I went to Cornell University world. again. What's that? In the well. <laughs> There was some that might that might this, might might this, challenge that assertion, right? I think twenty twenty three. I think I think the Bartlett's just won the best architecture college in the world. Oh wow! Oh, some GSD, table what are you doing? What's I don't happening? Know. I'm I'm waving the flag of the Bartlett because okay, fair I'm, enough, fair I'm enough. Being, I'm being tribal. But. And well, so we both have illustrious pedigrees. Absolutely. So it, we, we came from the inner sanctum, the temples of, we came from the inner sanctum of the temples of architecture, right? So I myself, you know, Cornell, a great school, love it, very much a theoretical school, very much sort of the REM, you know, following in the footsteps of Le Corbusier, REM Coolhouse, um, you know, that kind of uh, aura around Cornell, very, very heavy on the uh, on the theory side of the way that they teach and practice. What was it like at Bartlett? I have imagined, I, I have a suspicion of the same, Ryan? Yeah, it really was. I mean, the, <laughs> the main kind of question that was being asked at university was, what is architecture and what is it to be an architect? There which are go. very powerful. Very which existential. Are very, which are very powerful questions, don't get me wrong. And of course, like I thoroughly enjoyed my time at university and if I had been more aware of what it was actually like in an architecture studio, I guarantee you I wouldn't have completed an architecture degree. Yeah. Well, and tell me, let's talk about that. So we've, we've experienced working. Yep. Yep. So talk to me about what that experience was like for you. Um, uh, because I have a feeling there's a lot of architects who suffer in silence and think that that's just the way it needs to be. Um, so I, I so I, to talk about university as well, I do think it's important to recognise that the universities are a business and they are selling bums on seats. Now, this is a key distinction. Why would you bring that up right now, Ryan? Because I think it has influenced the way that architectural education operates. So and what you're saying is the, the universities who by their very essence typically especially the architectural colleges who are typically opposed to the idea of commerce, capitalism, and money as a means of exchange. I'm just being a little dramatic here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't quote me on this. Um, but well, yeah, I mean, I mean, classically, we are themselves not are themselves money making machines. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are. They're yeah. businesses and they've got to, you know, the Bartlett has a brand. 
the brand of the Bartlett is a very powerful brand in the architecture world. You know, I'm even, you know, you kind of, you hold on to it and it's, it's got cachet. It's got cachet. And, you know, people want to have the Bartlett students in their, in their offices. And you go to the exhibitions and they're extraordinary explosions of creative fervor and energy just like kind of mind-bending drawings that you don't understand and just extraordinary models and it's just this intense explosion of you know of of creativity and of and you know certainly in the past it was a place where um it was a it was there was a lot of it was you were it was renowned for being a hard working place and it's gotten itself into a little bit of trouble in the past with that, but that's another that's another conversation. Well, let's talk about that. But, so one of the things that we see in architecture is this idea of, so let's talk about some of the challenges and some of the things that are difficult about being an architect, right? So long working hours is one thing that uh, mm -hmm. that typically we see, uh, we see a, a, there's a tension between practitioners who've been practicing for longer versus people who are coming up in the industry. So a lot of times we hear, uh, you know, people that have been around for longer saying, I don't understand these, these younger generation, they, they don't want to put in the work, you know, they want to leave it. They want to clock in at eight and out at five and they want to take an hour long lunch. And then like, even if the project is 30 minutes away from completion, they'll leave at 5 PM and they'll come back and finish the next day. Right. Which is extremely frustrating for, especially firm owners who are working on deadlines and, and have to deal with the realities of, of getting projects done in a timely fashion under a certain budget, et cetera. Right. So, but let's go back to long working hours. Like this is, you know, there was the whole blow up in Cyric. What was that last year or the year before where mm -hmm. some professors made some faux pas in, in, in their communication. Yep. Uh, in regards to a, a, a student asking about fair labor practices for uh, for intern architects and people coming up and getting a living wage because it's expensive to live in the big cities like Manhattan and Los Angeles and and then of course the well-meaning professor you know I, I can see where she was coming from she said look I started my practice I was bartending on the weekends right but it came across as dismissive and we we, we you can search the internet for what happened uh, there but. But it does bring up, there, there's a spotlight being shown here on the fact that, let's just, let's step back a second, right? Like low, low, low wages, are there low wages for architects? Because I hear nowadays, like what people at entry-level positions are commanding today are very different from what they commanded back in, in the day than I was, uh, when I was starting as an architect. Here in the U.S., starting salaries especially in a time like this or high sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. Right? So what, what are some of the negative, what are some of the challenging aspects of practicing architecture today? Especially if, if you're a business owner running a practice or just in the industry in general. I'll say one thing was architecture sold as a as a creative endeavor. Mm -hmm. And most of the time you're sitting in front of a computer doing reflected ceiling plans or coordinating detail bubble callouts. It's much more akin to a data entry type of position than a creative position. And herein lies kind of going back to the, the and I think one of the, the, one of the equations that's not quite balanced here in the industry is that, the work that you do as an architect in an architecture office, certainly at the beginning, there is a lot of menial tasks, high detail orientated things, coordination of information. There's a lot of drudgery, let's put it that way. Um, a lot of drudgery. And, and there's, you know, a lot of it hasn't, doesn't, hasn't been automated. Okay, so that yep. a lot of practices haven't taken advantage of what technology is available to do to do stuff, um, and then we end up having very highly qualified people doing that kind of work, which is in itself not great for business, because mm -hmm. this is why people complain about the salaries. But the salaries actually reflect the value of the work that's being done, and there is some sort of 
societal economic value of the work that the architect is doing, hence why the fees and the salaries are low. Okay, now that's right. in part the lack of, you know, the you know the the practices not taking any care over their marketing and their sales to better position themselves as as something that's high of that's something that's high of high value but the you know a young in the UK like a young part 1 architect or a part 2 architect the you know the the salaries are way lower than what they are in the, in the US but we would i probably assert that we've got a, a lower um living costs as well well maybe not in the center of london um but the the salaries are reflecting you know that th- it's not that it's not that much it's not highly skilled work mm mm exactly for the, so mar- this, for yes. the most part for the most part yeah. there, there is yeah. you know but we but we have very intelligent thoughtful creative people doing that work okay uh, so yes. there's a bit of a dis- disjunct you, so you've got you've got someone who's got 10 years worth of tertiary 10 years in many cases yeah. This is the same as a doctor or a or a you know a surgeon, right? Yes. And now they're doing you know they're changing numbers on a on drawing titles and things like that. So they're kind of coming out overqualified and then going into a job which doesn't need all of that creativity. And it's interesting that we start to see this trend of architects if they turn left when they come out of the architecture school and they go into a different industry, um, you know, maybe something that's um, kind of UX design is a good example of where you can kind of see the similarities um, with architecture and and it's kind of in the and it's in a tech based company which is selling a service which is solving a very clear problem for somebody, and they're innovating something and the money can just shoot up through the roof. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you were seeing architects getting way better remunerated in different in different tangential um, industries, and they're getting paid in the in their in their actual field. Okay, and then also we've got this other this other kind of problem from an employer's standpoint that well they don't want to pay more for an uh, for a, a newly qualified architect because there's a load of skills missing that they need for the business that the mm-hmm. school hasn't provided necessarily. Okay, so construction knowledge is a big one that's just missing. And, you know, the lack of construction knowledge and the lack of all these other kinds of skill sets is also another reason why they're doing the low lab- the low skilled labor in the first place mm-hmm. when they come straight out of university. Mm-hmm. And again, it just reflects the it reflects the um the um what's the word? It reflects the value of the of the position. And this is why mm-hmm. I go back to my original point of of talking about arch- architecture schools are a business because they are in in one part they've got bums on seats to fill they've got to get those people in there and the way that the curriculums are ten are are generally kind of scripted is to attract other students and to attract talent and to attract intellectual talent and if you're a school like Cornell or the Bartler these places they need to be able to market their in intellectual might so that they can be they can remain at the top of these kind of university league tables and they can keep getting whatever funding that they get from other places and there's a prestige you know that comes with being a student at one of these places and then that becomes you know the architecture companies want to have well, we get those sorts of students because those are the those are the hard working students Okay. And I certainly know from experience that many architecture practices, they might look at Bartlett students, they don't care that you've, how creative you are. They know that you're going to work your ass off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that you're, and now that you've got, and now you've got a tolerance for, you know, you've got a tolerance for being able to endure a kind of suffering. And you're fully indoctrinated into some sort of vision of something. And, you know we can we can use that in our in our businesses okay so it's kind of again been a bit sort of overly dramatic here with it but there, i don't think it's overly the, dramatic the i think it sounds design. right on <laughs> well and it goes back to the question that <laughs> so, we so ask we ha- here that we're, we're we're constantly putting out there which is should you as an architect should you have to sacrifice your health 
your mental sanity, your financial well-being, your relationships outside of work to do work that you love. And it seems like there's a culture of the answer being yes, whether it's been... Again, again, the the other thing here, let's go back to this idea that the the universities are a business and they're selling the idea of doing what you love Mm -hmm. and getting paid for it. Yes. Right? And they're they're also selling the idea of you do you. You do Mm -hmm. your thing that's really interesting for you and the rest of the world rewards you for it. Mm. And it's a slightly mm. more nuanced and sophisticated reality mm. out there. Because when we, co- when we come out and we set up an architecture practice, we're not really thinking about solving a problem as such. We're usually thinking about me and my projects that I want to do. And yeah, the more expression. Often than not, yeah, the expression of something. And more often than not, people are more interested in the kind of building that they want to do than the type of client that they want to work with. Yeah, helping a retailer sell more clothing or helping a, a client achieve their goals. Yeah, exactly. So, so there's no value there's, from, in the architecture school or the architecture, um, like a very pro- prominent architectural mindset is that those things are not valuable to society. Mm-hmm. That's, not that, that's, not a, that's not a, you know, we shouldn't be, be doing that. So then we become... Then we start to see, um, you know, there's there's kind of doing design for me and my ideas that we're at university. Okay, so I, I would I would say that there is something about architecture when it's on the unhealthy balance. But I mean, also I mean, there's a part and parcel of you learning to be a designer. You go through this, and you have to you have to make it about you. At, at, you know, when you're learning, but we can kind of get quite attached to that about it being about me and my work and my accolades and my status and my expression into the world. That's it's a little bit selfish. It's a little bit selfish. It's a little bit of a selfish um, approach to anything in life. And, it, you know, starting a business around something which is about me, this is tough. Yeah, well, and, and and so that's that's kind of a root cause. But what we see is we see pr- this. Let's call it an energy, an underlying energy or underlying story or narrative in the architecture industry. That that let's face it, we're the enlightened designers, and we're going to go out there and revolutionize the world through good design. Like I get that. This is at, at a core level. This is what we need to believe as architects, right? Mm-hmm. So, like at a certain level, I would say that that's proper and 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 important and valuable right and yet what happens is now architects they don't bring in we don't do we don't do a good job of bringing in the other side like is it possible to marry up the client centric approach with the design innovation approach so a lot of times we see a splintering in the way firms operate we say okay there are firms like the architects of record you have the design firms that come in do the beautiful amazing creative designs that probably are you know some of it's not all well thought out some of it's not even buildable then they hand that off to the architect of record and these are like the production workhorses who like you know they're like the commercial firms that like turn that into something that actually be built and 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 make it happen right does there need to be this disjuncture does there need to be this this gap does there need to be this antithesis between these two sides or is there a healthy harmonious marrying up of them both like the yin yang the uh the symbol you know the uh um in Taoism, you all know what i'm talking about right the circle with like the two looks like two two fish or two sperm depending on how you think about it <laughs> and they have the little eyes you know the different color yeah for me, it was just that was always town and country surf symbol is what I thought. You know, back in anyone who's listening in like the eighties, you remember the TNC the town and country. You guys didn't have that in London, did you, Ryan? There's a surf company that appropriated that symbol, the yin yang symbol. No, you would have seen what, it. On what I love about go ahead. Kung, you would have seen it on lots of kung fu. Yeah, martial, yeah. There you go. Martial, martial, martial. The kung fu dojos. Well, and yeah. this is a beautiful part. It's like, is 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 there a way? I think to me. That's what that symbol represents. It represents the harmonious marrying up and the interconnected, the interdependence of two opposing paradoxes. 
right? So in architecture, yeah, we have there is there is a there is a a paradox between the ideals of of design sometimes, and then the ideals of well that 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 begs the question: what is design, right? But what we have is we have the split in the industry of all different shapes and sizes, and there's definitely a when I've experienced in my career, there's definitely an, an idealization of 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 the making of forms and the ex- pure expression of 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 architecture over the other business goals that that clients might have. Right. So very often, um, when we see awards being given, a lot of times it's on form primarily. Well, it's very right. it's very difficult, I think, as an architect. I mean, I've struggled with this to not think about your project in terms of its photographic output at the end, and some sort of collection to your portfolio. Well, can we keep that? The and question is, can we keep that, and can we just add in the other part? Like, can architecture progress and evolve? You said something earlier in this conversation, Ryan, that I thought was very telling, which is that um, typically architectural practices, we don't necessarily have the latest technologies. And even in the industry, we do, we're, not nece- we're not definitely not harnessing all the technologies that are out there to help us um, improve what we do. Mm-hmm. Like, I've heard people say before that architecture and building and construction in general is maybe 10 to 20 years behind the SaaS industry. Right, who are always on the cutting edge, the tech industry. So now, nowadays, we have things like AI coming out. You know, I know a lot of the tasks that I did as an entry level architect could be easily done through AI. If AI could write a narrative story from scratch, could not an AI understand how a building gets put together and make sure all the callouts are appropriate and make sure all the codes are followed? Absolutely, I think so. Absolutely, I mean, right. we're even seeing some very impressive things with AI and on the creative side uh-huh. of being able to generate, uh, you know, kind of ideas and, and, and scripting and, you know, the, the kind of opportunities that there are going to be for, for other people to be able to be, you know, put their hands in as a designer. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. And like going back to technology, Ryan, um, all of us architects, we bemoan the fact that we pay $5,000 per seat for a, 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 a it's not that much now, but uh, uh, a seat of AutoCAD or Revit. Yeah. Right. Like these, these aren't, these aren't cheap. And the question then becomes, why don't we have the funds to make these kind of investments? Why don't we have the funds to pay great salaries that are attractive to keep people so they don't jump over to other industries. Why don't we have the money to give living wages to our architects who are starting out? And you got to wonder, well, it sounds like it's all coming down to money, Enoch. Is that what you're saying, Enoch? It comes down to money? What am I listening to here? Well, this is the business of architecture after all. Welcome, listeners. If you didn't know, this conversation is going to be about money and architecture. Yes, we're going to talk about money as if it actually matters. Changing I, I, the conversation. You know, we, we, we have the money is one of the things that gets sacrificed first in order to stand to some ideals, if you like. Or mm-hmm. that's often the kind of that's how the argument cloaks itself. Mm-hmm. Okay, and I think I think a lot of us as architects have, have you know been guilty of of that. And also, there is a lack of I really do think there is a lack of uh, understanding, caring, even sometimes with what the client's budget is and how they've gone through the process of financing it. I think it cha- I think it's very interesting when I've interviewed architects who have moved on to development. Mm. And I remember mm. when speaking to one architect and they, they, were, they went on to, to the development side for a project and they ended up hiring another architect. And the annoyance that they experienced when they sensed that the architect that they had hired was getting too into making um, the elevation 
look the way it looked for their portfolio and for their kind of you know renders that they wanted to have and and that they weren't listening to what the budget constraints were and what the and what what was needing and they kept on you know kind of pushing back with these very articulate arguments about you know uh, i thought that was interesting because it was like yeah. you know now you now your money is on the line here and this is something that i, I think you know i think the, anyone who's gone through the building process or done work on their house or or, or anything you you know you kind of quickly have a different sense of what it's like to be letting go of large amounts of money out of your you know your 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 bank account and the kind of stress that comes with it and then also the decisions that get made uh around it and why why were why were things done why were things done done that way and and also the general person if you like the their sophistication in appreciating design is not as as we know not as refined as an architect's and architects mm -hmm. do tend to like certain types of things which aren't always popular and there is a there is a subjective element to this there absolutely is i know um you know i've worked with clients before in the past where i i've wanted the design to go in a certain direction and we haven't gone down there because of the budget and we've gone for another 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 way and they've finished it the way that they've wanted to finish it and you know put in um furniture that i wouldn't have chosen and isn't that frustrating i hate it when that happens oh and you're like oh this is not bad. but they're totally happy with it they love it it works know. simple it works for them it's perfect for them it solves all the problems they're really small-minded you know, designs philistines <laughs> I said small small minded design philistines. You know, but <laughs> but that's that's a perfect example, right? And at the end of the day, we can blame the developers, we can blame the clients, we can blame society in general. But at the end of the day, when you point at someone, there's always at least three fingers pointing back at herself. Unless you do the uh, unless you do the straight handed point, some people do that. All, all fingers straight ahead. See that? <laughs> see, I'm doing this in the video right now. You can't see. There's one finger. But that's a handshake. Uh, that's what. That that's, a hand oh, that's a handshake. Oh, that's a handshake. That's true. Shake hands. Yeah. So, so when will we start? When will we start valuing ourselves? I think. Not. I think. I know. This is what it comes down to, Ryan. Is that we at a certain level? We doubt our own value as architects. What do you think? I think that is, I think there's a lot of truth in that. I think the industry finds itself needing and wanting to be very agreeable. I think there's a lack of agency in terms of, again, I, I really, I mean, you know, this is, this is what we do. We talk about the business of architecture and the financial, um, in, like the importance of financial empowerment to have agency to be able to do something and you know when you don't have that knowledge skill understanding interest even i think your business is gonna it's just hard Everything you know some ryan something's very cool that i've been seeing recently which is you know some of the some of the smaller newer firms that reach out to us about joining our smart practice program um it's interesting to see how much more savvy they are around business, around marketing, mm -hmm. around they're just they're way more savvy around business than the old guard, you know, the established yeah. established firm. So it's going to be I think the tide right. is changing, whether you want it or Absolutely. not. The tide is yeah. changing. The new and upcoming architecture being more innovative. They're being more innovative in the way that they they get the work done, so they're able to get it done at a less fee while also having greater profit. Um, and this is going to be the way the industry is continue, going to continue to go. So the question isn't, you know, isn't should you or should you not embrace this? The question is, when will you? Because if you yeah. don't, you're going to be like a dinosaur and you're going to find yourself out, outside of a job. I, I, I do think that I do think that's interesting. You know, there's lots of lots of younger architects and, you know, the, the YouTube generation has got a big part of this. And, you know, yeah. we're, not, we're not the only business podcast out there for architects. Um, right, the best right. one. 
That's that's indeed exactly the yeah. best one, and the one that should be subscribed now. Yep. Um, but there, but there is there's, there's more kind of business knowledge and education out there on the internet. There's just an enormous amount of information and education on the internet, and also, yep. um, you know, people are young students are kind of seeing the potential of technology and you know social media and social media is so it's what you use to communicate with your peer group mm -hmm. right so they're kind of so fluent in it that marketing and communicating to client groups and building audiences and tribes and things like that for them that's not marketing that's just how you communicate with the world exactly exactly and so, and so it's so much more kind of you know prevalent and people are starting to to realize that they can you know they can they can do all sorts of things and i think the i think that's i think that's very exciting i agree yeah, i, I mean you is. just look at it all comes down to a narrative and a, and a story because you can look at you can say okay let's take a look at uh architectural practices right now who are strapped for cash like who aren't making a lot of money now right now there's probably less of them because we're in a boom time but we can look at that and we can say okay how much are you investing in marketing nothing how much do you invest in, how much time do you invest in strategic planning? Nothing, right? And the thing is, is the old guard, us as architects, we, we didn't see these things as being connected, right? We didn't see the fact that we don't market actually being connected. So we didn't see marketing as an investment. We didn't see strategic we, planning. I'm too busy guard? to plan. I'm too busy to go to a business training seminar. <laughs> Are we the old guard? Well, we were raised in it. I think we were raised in it, but we're we're definitely espousing. We're leading the charge of the new guard. Let's face it, we're on the we're on the front lines, converting the masses. As many architects as will hear the sound of our voice and will hearken to the new way of architecture, are being enlightened and joining the ranks of uh, of architects who are savvy, who are marrying up business savvy with design savvy. So I would say, you know, I did start out in the old guard. I'm very familiar with it. Um, even when I started my practice, I was definitely had a lot of those similar mindsets and thought processes, but yeah, that has changed over the past decade. I think the, the, the not putting finance money and considering the pet potential of capitalism for yourself and for your business and for the mission that you want to be fulfilling on. is a danger if you're going to run an architecture business. Okay. Okay. I agree, Ryan. Now, there we go. Cool. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah. One more thing today. I want to thank Dr. Ellen Ritchie for leaving a five-star review for the show. Dr. Ritchie writes, Thank you for bringing out the best of your guests. Personal stories and discussions of values, thoughtful questions, and your constant regard for your guests keeps me coming back for more. Reviewers help people find the show. So if you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. I'd love to read your name out here. And now a word from our sponsor, RCAT. Accurate data, as you know, is crucial, especially in today's tough environment. Outdated and inaccurate project data, specification data, etc. can lead to turnarounds, delays, and costs. With supply chain and staffing issues, these costs and delays can multiply. Well, that's why a resource like RCAT.com is so valuable. RCAT works with manufacturers to keep their data up to date and accurate so you always have the best information for your projects and for your specifications when you need it. In addition to that, accessing the data on RCAT.com is completely free and you don't need to register. Use RCAT's powerful search engine to be able to find what you need and download right there on the site without needing to pay anything or like I said, even register. Go try RCAT.com today. That's A-R-C-A-T dot com. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.